Hi everyone, this is lecture 15, Muscle Physiology. So today we're going to talk about skeletal muscle. We're going to begin with reviewing a bit about skeletal muscle anatomy. We're going to then talk about the activation and response in a muscle through excitation-contraction coupling, part of which is the sliding filament theory. And then we will talk about how to get stronger muscle contractions through the mechanics of muscles and how the metabolism of muscles being so active is supported with certain specializations. So I want to remind you that skeletal muscle is not the only type of muscle in the body. We also have smooth muscle and cardiac muscle. Smooth muscle and cardiac muscle are both involuntary, and smooth muscle is found in the majority of organs and also in the blood vessels. Some examples of smooth muscle are control of blood vessels, airways, digestive tract, urinary tract, and then cardiac muscle is found in the heart. So cardiac muscle um, is responsible for pumping blood through the chambers of the heart, the atria, and the ventricles. When we talk about muscle, muscle in general, we're talking about skeletal muscle. So for the rest of this lecture, we'll be talking about skeletal muscle, which is the voluntary movement of the body, and in that process, it also can generate heat. I'll give you some more functions in a second. So some examples of skeletal muscle are muscles that attach to the limbs and move the limbs, muscles that attach to the jaw and move the, move the jaw for chewing, um, muscles that that are um, aiding in breathing, so some very important functions of muscles. I also want to briefly remind you of the difference in histology for these three types of muscle. So both skeletal and cardiac muscle, when we look at them under the microscope and look at individual cells, skeletal muscle, here's one individual cell here, there are these very elongated rectangular cells that have these striped appearance. So this striped appearance, these dark bands and light bands, are called striations. Here you will have nuclei of which muscle cells have multiple, skeletal muscle cells have multiple nuclei. Cardiac muscle also has dark and light bands, it also has striations, but it is unique in the sense that it is more branching and that it also has these dark staining regions here, which actually are gap junction containing structures called, called intercalated discs. And we'll talk more about those when we get to cardiac muscle. Smooth muscle is not striated, so it does not have the striped appearance of skeletal and cardiac muscle. And um, its muscle cells look sort of more pinnate or sort of worm-like. They're pointed at the ends and they have single nuclei. So to focus now on skeletal muscle. So the major functions of skeletal muscle are movement, that's the main one, and it's a voluntary movement. Muscles will attach directly or indirectly to the bone, and they will then pull and move the bones or sometimes tissue such as the skin when they contract. So this is why you guys had to learn so much in anatomy about origin, insertion, and action, because where the muscles attach to tells you first where the muscle is braced to be held on to, and second, what the muscle is pulling on to move. Muscles also maintain posture and body position. There are some muscles in our body that are continuously contracting to make adjustments. Muscles also stabilize joints. There are some tendons that are crossing joints, um, and muscle tone provides the stability to some of those joints. Also, as muscles are active during contraction, that activity generates heat. So muscles as a secondary um, function can also create heat or work with thermogenesis. So we know that we, you know, we shiver when we get cold. And the, the importance of that is not the actual contraction or the movement of the body. The importance of that is the heat generation that comes after the contraction. So let's look then at skeletal muscle anatomy. I'm sure that you guys did this in um, your regular anatomy course, um, but let's look at it briefly. So here your textbook has a picture of a whole muscle, so for example, your bicep muscle. And I want you to think of the whole muscle as an organ. So each muscle in your body is like its own tiny organ. 
And if we slice that muscle open, we will see several different bundles. Those bundles we call fascicles. And then if we look within the fascicles, an individual fascicle will have several muscle cells. A muscle cell is the same thing as a muscle fiber. Those words are used interchangeably. So muscle cell, muscle fiber, same thing. So then we look inside at a muscle cell here. The muscle cell is so densely packed with contractile organelles that you almost can't see any other organelles within the cell. So each one of these little cylinders is a tiny organelle called a myofibril. And the myofibrils then are packed with contractile proteins that are arranged in a sarcomere. So there's your muscle. There's your individual muscle cell, of which many are bundled inside a single muscle. And then there's your muscle cell or muscle fiber, which has many, many contractile organelles or myofibrils. And those myofibrils then have a certain protein arrangement we call the sarcomere. There's a larger picture. And then here we go, the muscle cell with the sarcomere focused in. So I want you to notice there are many sarcomeres per myofibril, many myofibrils per muscle cell or muscle fiber. So the major contractile proteins within a muscle muscle cell within these myofibril organelles are called myosin and actin. Myosin makes up the thick filaments and actin makes up the thin filaments. The myosin and actin are arranged in a very specific overlapping pattern that creates those striations that you see when you look at skeletal muscle histology. So we are going to draw out the sarcomere um, to remind you guys of its anatomy. So let's draw this out. Okay, so for a sarcomere, um, remember that there are several of these within a single myofibril and then several myofibrils within a single muscle cell. And we start by denoting the ends of the sarcomere at a region we call the Z-line. So from Z-line to Z-line is one single sarcomere. So this whole thing and will be one sarcomere. And then attached to the Z-line are the thin filaments, which are made up of actin. So here we have thin filaments. Made up of actin. Then at the center of the sarcomere, we have a central line that we call the M line, so that denotes the center of the sarcomere. And then stretched across the center, we have our thick filaments. So the thick filaments are made up of myosin. And myosin contains these head groups that want to grab on to the actin. I'm not going to draw all of them here. It would take forever, but you guys get the idea, right? So myosin has the head groups, makes up the thick filaments. Then we have some regions of the sarcomere that um, are denoted by overlapping or non-overlapping regions of the um, actin and myosin. Um, region or actin and myosin thick and thin filaments. <clears throat> so where we have only myosin, this is the H zone or the H band. Where we have only actin and stretching across to the next sarcomere is the I band. So we will also have an I band on the other side here, where we have just actin on either side. And then the region that contains both actin and myosin is going to be the A band. So we have I, A, I, 
and then we have the H zone at the center. So again, we could do it this way. Here's your H zone. Then we have a band which contains the H zone and the actin and myosin overlapping regions. And then we have the I band which is on either side with just actin. So why are we doing this? The, we're doing this because the sarcomere is the contractile unit of the muscle cell, and we're going to see how it changes as we study the contraction of the muscle. So let's look in a little bit more closely at the individual proteins that we're talking about. So myosin forms the thick filaments, and you can see the head groups here on the myosin. So it looks kind of like a golf club with head groups. The myosin contains binding sites for actin, and the myosin wants to grab on to the actin. The myosin heads also contain an ATPase site, which can activate the myosin. Multiple myosins group together to form a whole thick filament where you will have lots of myosin heads sticking out, reaching towards the actin. Actin then forms the thin filaments. Actin molecules contain myosin binding sites to where myosin wants to grab onto the actin. That's what's shown here in these sort of dark green sites here. So actin protein binds together to make the thin filaments, and they're sort of arranged in this twisting helix pattern. There are also two regulatory proteins found on actin. So this one that looks like a rope stretching across and blocking all of the myosin binding sites is called tropomyosin. And then this one here that's in the lighter tan color is holding on to the tropomyosin and locking the tropomyosin onto the actin. So I say that tropomyosin and troponin, that's troponin is the lock, are like a chastity belt. So the myosin head wants to bind onto the actin, but tropomyosin prevents that binding site from being available. So tropomyosin wraps around and then troponin is like the lock that locks the chastity belt closed so that the actin is not available because the tropomyosin is locked on by the troponin. So again, myosin with the myosin heads and then actin with its helical pattern making the thin filaments blocked by tropomyosin and tropomyosin held on by troponin. And then here are just some pictures for your reference to see the sarcomere pattern. I also want to show you the histology um, and how these um, different bands and zones of the sarcomere are named. So the I band is the light band, the A band is the dark band, the M line forms at the center, and then the Z line is a dark line in between the I bands. And then there's the histology again. Okay. So again, we're doing this because the sarcomere is the contractile unit. So when a muscle cell is relaxed, its individual myofibrils are also relaxed. And you'll see that the actin is stretched further away and you have a large H zone when the muscle cell is relaxed. When you contract a muscle, the individual proteins will change and the actin is going to move closer towards the M line, making the H zone very, very small. By nature of that, that also makes the I band shorter. So everything moves in closer to the center during contraction. Overall, that means that contraction is literally shortening of the sarcomeres that are within the myofibrils and the total shortening of the muscle cell itself. So the sarcomere changes during contraction. This makes the H zone smaller, the I band smaller, and it moves the Z lines closer together. The A band and the M line do not change. Why? Because the myosin stays in place. 
So it is only the zones that have actin that change, and the A band only encompasses the end of the myosin to the end of the myosin. So the dark band stays the same, the light band gets smaller. Okay, now that we understand a little bit about the anatomy uh, within the muscle cell, let's talk about excitation-contraction coupling. So muscle contraction is caused by activation of the muscle cell, in other words, depolarization from the nervous system. And then it responds by contracting. So the steps of excitation-contraction coupling are these. We start with an action potential, which comes from the nervous system. That causes calcium release. That activates troponin. That's the lock. That releases tropomyosin. That's the rope or the chastity belt. Tropomyosin is pulled off of the myosin binding sites on actin, and then the myosin heads grab onto actin. Once the myosin heads grab onto actin, they move the actin in a power stroke, and then everything needs to reset. So let's go through these steps one by one. Okay, step one. The action potential reaches the muscle cell membrane. Now, if you're having trouble understanding the action potential, you may want to go back and review the prior nervous system introductory lectures where we talked about membrane potential and action potential. But the ultimate um, outcome of the action potential is that electrical activity travels down the motor neuron and reaches the neuromuscular junction. So that contacts the muscle and acetylcholine is released onto the muscle. So the neurotransmitter is released onto the muscle here. So here is a motor neuron in blue coming from the spinal cord, going out the ventral root of the spinal cord and traveling to the muscle fibers that it innervates. This particular one has four muscle fibers for the blue neuron. Here's a red motor neuron traveling out of the spinal cord out the ventral root and going to the muscle fibers that it innervates. And each little contact that a motor neuron makes with a muscle cell is a neuromuscular junction. So the action potential reaches the muscle cell membrane through the acetylcholine release at the neuromuscular junction. Remember how synaptic activation happens. So here's the motor neuron. Here's the action potential traveling down the motor neuron. There's the neurotransmitter being released. In this case, it's acetylcholine. And traveling across the synaptic, excuse me, traveling across the synaptic cleft and then attaching to or binding to the acetylcholine receptors. These receptors, acetylcholine receptors, are ion channels. So when the neurotransmitter binds to the receptor, it opens up the ion channels and sodium rushes into the muscle cell membrane. When sodium rushes into the muscle cell membrane, that then causes electrical activity or action potential traveling into the muscle cell itself. That action potential in the muscle cell is then going to make changes within the muscle cell. So that specific change that is made when the depolarization of the muscle cell membrane is caused is calcium. So the depolarization of the muscle cell membrane causes calcium release. The depolarization spreads into the membrane in these Invaginations of the membrane we call T-tubules. So here's the muscle cell membrane here in red. So the depolarization or the excitation of sodium traveling down the membrane will then be transmitted down the T-tubules. So the depolarization goes down the T-tubules, which are really just membrane that has dipped down into the muscle cell. So down the T-tubules, and then it reaches the structure that's drawn here in green, which is the sarcoplasmic reticulum. The sarcoplasmic reticulum is a modified endoplasmic reticulum, so it's a branching network um, of membranous organelle that stores calcium. 
So the sarcoplasmic reticulum is holding on to calcium and waiting for the depolarization to travel down the T-tubules. Once the depolarization travels down the T-tubules, then calcium will be released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So depolarization spreads down the T-tubules. That sends a signal to the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and then the sarcoplasmic reticulum dumps calcium onto, and see right here, this cylinder is the sarcomere. So let's look a little bit more closely here. So we have depolarization of the muscle cell membrane, depolarization spreading down the T-tubules, and then causing activation of the sarcoplasmic reticulum that then is going to dump calcium all over the myofibrils of which they are wrapped around. So here's the myofibril, and now you can see if we remove the sarcoplasmic reticulum, you can see just below that, that's where you're going to have your myosin here in red, and then your actin in blue, just waiting for that calcium signal. So what the calcium does is it activates troponin. So it unlocks the key. So calcium binds to, here in yellow is the troponin, calcium binds to the troponin, and the troponin unlocks and releases from tropomyosin. Once the calcium releases from tropomyosin, tropomyosin, which is this rope-like protein that was, remember it was stretched on top of and bound to the myosin binding sites on actin, now, tropomyosin, that's what these arrows are showing, tropomyosin is now moved out of the way. So the actin binding sites are available. And now the myosin heads are able to bind specifically to the actin because the tropomyosin is not blocking anymore. So tropomyosin is released, freeing the actin. The next step is that the myosin heads will bind to the actin, and when the myosin heads bind to the actin, we form what's called a cross bridge. So that binding is cross bridge formation. So here's your myosin head binding to the actin. Then step six is that the myosin heads move the actin. So they bind to the actin and now they're gonna, like a ratchet, move the actin inwards towards the M line. This movement is called the power stroke and it requires ATP. The last step then is that myosin detaches from the actin, so the myosin was bound to the actin in the cross bridge, it moved the actin in a power stroke. Now the myosin has to detach and reset and get ready for another contraction. That detaching and resetting also requires ATP. After that, calcium is returned to the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So there are calcium pumps located in the sarcoplasmic reticulum that stop the calcium signal, and that resets the calcium also to prepare for the next contraction. So I think we should probably take a second to draw out these three steps. So let's go back to the one through six and draw these out. Okay, so for excitation contraction coupling, okay, excitation contraction coupling, we have the neuron coming down and contacting the muscle cell. And the muscle cell has this striated appearance because of the arrangement of the sarcomere. So if we zoom in on this, what we see then is a synapse, which is the neuromuscular junction, and the action potential coming down the synapse. So this is the action potential going down the axon of the motor neuron and then reaching the muscle cell. And we're now zooming in really close on this to look at just the individual synapse. Okay. So the action potential comes in 
that activates the whole cascade of neurotransmitter release. Go back to your nervous system lectures if you don't remember that whole cascade. Neurotransmitter gets released. The neurotransmitter here is acetylcholine, which I'm going to abbreviate with ACH. That is going to reach the muscle cell membrane and bind to acetylcholine receptors. When it binds to these acetylcholine receptors, sodium floods the muscle cell membrane. When sodium rushes in, we're then going to get an action potential in the muscle cell itself. So the action potential is going to travel down the muscle cell and as it travels down the muscle cell, it's going to traverse down the T-tubules. So it goes across the muscle cell membrane, and then it goes down into the muscle through the T-tubules. The action potential goes across the membrane and down the T-tubules. And the T-tubules are very close to the sarcoplasmic reticulum. The sarcoplasmic reticulum is storing calcium and are going to dump calcium when the action potential comes in. So the calcium will be then dumped inside the muscle cell and it's going to then activate troponin. So troponin will be active. That's going to move tropomyosin out of the way. The tropomyosin out of the way then frees up the actin. I'm going to draw that over here. Okay, so now the actin is free and the binding sites on the actin are now available to the myosin. So myosin can bind. When myosin binds to the actin, that is a cross bridge. Then the myosin is going to move the actin, and that is a power stroke. After that, the myosin will unbind, reset, and everything will detach. The calcium will also be pumped back to the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Okay, so action potential comes in, calcium release, troponin unlocks, tropomyosin moves out of the way, myosin binds to actin, forms a cross bridge, myosin pulls the actin, power stroke, and then everything resets. So let's zoom back forward then. During the power stroke, the myosin head moves the actin towards the center of the sarcomere. So I wanted to show you guys this picture so you have an idea of how this works. And what I always say is that the actin is like the lead singer in a rock band. And he's there waiting, but his security is holding him back, right? The troponin and tropomyosin. And then the myosin are like the crazy fans that are waiting for him to crowd surf. So they're like, ah, like wanting to grab onto him. And then as soon as he's free, as soon as security lets him go and he jumps into the crowd, then he can crowd surf and the myosin can grab him and move him forward. So the myosin grabs onto the actin and moves it forward towards the M line, shortening the entire sarcomere.
So if we look at this sort of in three dimension, here's a relaxed sarcomere with the myosin thick filaments in the center and the actin thin filaments on the edges towards the Z line. And then during this process of the power stroke pulling the myosin in, that pulls the myosin in towards the middle and the entire sarcomere gets shortened. There is a summary figure in your textbook, which you may want to review, which goes over all of these steps as well. So the sliding filament theory then are basically steps three through six of excitation contraction coupling. So this is the mechanism of the myosin heads grabbing onto the actin and sliding it towards the center. So we call this the sliding filament theory, and the important piece of this is the calcium and ATP requirement. So calcium is the excitation signal required to free the myosin binding sites. This is important because this is linked to calcium homeostasis. So um, lack of calcium or low calcium in the body and depletion of calcium in a muscle can cause muscle weakening. So if you don't have calcium in a muscle cell, you will not have the release of troponin and you will not have the myosin binding to the actin. The muscle cell will then be unable to contract. But there's also normal pumping the calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, no calcium available to the troponin or being held back and stored in the sarcoplasmic reticulum, no binding will occur, the muscle will be relaxed. There are also two parts of this process that require ATP. ATP is required for the power stroke. ATP is also required for cross bridge release. If there is no ATP, then you will get no release. So you may have heard of a state called rigor mortis, where upon death, due to some um, uh, other mechanisms that occur, essentially you get a complete contraction of the muscle, which forms cross bridges, but when there's no ATP being made, because now the cells are dead, um, no recycling of the ATP, then there's no release of the muscle. So there is a state of fixed contraction immediately after death called rigor mortis in which all muscles in the body are contracted and unable to be released. Over time, of course, then the body will start to degrade and will be relaxed because the proteins are now degrading. But there is an initial state after death where no ATP is available to release the cross bridges. So here is the sliding filament theory and where ATP is important. So first, the myosin head is energized and ready to bind to actin. If calcium is present, then troponin is unlocked, tropomyosin moves out of the way, and the myosin can bind to the actin. After that binding, the myosin head then ratchets and moves the AT, excuse me, the actin over during the power stroke. Another ATP then is required for the detachment of the myosin and the re-energizing to prepare for the next step. If there's no fresh ATP available, then we form this rigor complex or rigor mortis in which the muscles are stuck in a contracted cross bridge power stroke state. So now that we've done a bit on how we excite and how muscles respond to that um, activation, I want to talk to you guys about how to get stronger muscle contractions. So um, what you have seen so far is just a tiny, tiny, tiny protein level contraction. So if you just had a single sarcomere contraction, or a single muscle cell contraction, which would be many, many sarcomeres within the myofibrils, you wouldn't get any tension, you wouldn't get any movement. You need many, many muscle cells to contract to actually get a successful movement. So the phases of muscle contraction are first, a single stimulus, and the delay. So it takes time for the excitation contraction to, to um, come together. So you'll get a stimulus and then you'll have a delay. That's called the latent period 
and then you'll have a period of contraction where the muscle is actually responding. This is cross, cross bridge cycling and tension in the muscle. The amount of tension that is created is going to depend on several factors which we'll talk about. And then there is a period of relaxation. So as calcium is transported back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, then cross bridge cycling ends and the tension of the muscle cell will decrease. So the actual timing here is approximately 30 to 100 milliseconds for a total contractile response. That's very different than the timing of an action potential. So a single action potential is about 1 to 2 milliseconds very fast. That delay then during the latent period as the action potential is traveling to the muscle cell um, will then be followed by the long contractile response. So the cross bridge cycling actually takes time, about 15 to 50 milliseconds for a contraction phase and about 15 to 50 milliseconds for a relaxation phase. So anywhere between 30 and 100 milliseconds for a single muscle contraction. So within a whole muscle, several muscle fibers will contract to create movement. So the way I like to think about this is, is have you ever had a muscle twitch in your eye? Just like a teeny, teeny little twitch. Very, very small, right? So a single muscle cell activated, or a single uh, muscle contraction we call a twitch. But it actually creates a lot, it actually takes a lot more to apply force and actually move something. So contracting the muscle creates tension, but we need to contract many, many muscle cells within that muscle to get a strong enough contraction that will actually move the thing that it is trying to move, and it's trying to move the bone. So the tension creates force. We need to then get enough force to actually move that thing we're trying to move, which is the bone. The bone itself then, and anything being held on the bone, so for example, if I'm talking about my bicep muscle, which is bending my elbow or flexing my elbow, it's, there's a certain weight of just my forearm and my hand that will be a normal load, but I could also grab a textbook and that would be a heavier load, which the bicep would then also have to create enough force to move in addition to the, the weight of the bone. So here's the bicep muscle, which is bending or flexing the elbow. And the bone itself and the weight of the hand is a certain amount. And then if you're holding anything in your hand, that also adds load to the muscle. In order to actually move the bone, hand, and whatever's being held in the hand, you need to create enough force using enough muscle cells and getting enough contraction within those muscle cells to actually pull with strong enough tension to move the load. So there are many types of muscle contraction. What we've talked about so far is muscle contraction causing shortening. That's called a concentric contraction. There are also muscle contractions that are used as stabilizing contractions. That is when the muscle actually lengthens or eccentric contraction. So an example of that is when I am flexing my elbow, that is a concentric contraction of the bicep because it's the bicep's primary movement but then the tricep on the back is actually lengthening. It is contracting while it lengthens to stabilize this movement of my elbow. So the primary mover would be my bicep. It's doing the concentric contraction. The antagonist then will be the tricep in this bending motion, and that's doing an eccentric contraction. We also have um, isotonic versus isometric contractions. So an isotonic contraction is when the load remains constant and the muscle shortens. So in other words, when I'm actually able to move that thing that I'm trying to move, this is a normal isotonic contraction and I haven't changed the weight of that load, I've just steadily moved it. 
if the load is too heavy or you're trying to move something that you cannot overcome, this is an isometric contraction. In this case, the tension develops and you're trying, trying, trying really hard. So if my textbook is too heavy and I can't actually lift it, I'm trying to lift it, but the bone and the load is not moved. So um, the isometric contraction is when you're trying to move something and you are continuing to increase in force, but you're not able to move it. So we then want to think about how can we actually move larger and larger loads. So how is it that we can get an increase in the strength of contraction? And there's many ways that muscles have solved this problem. So we're going to talk about recruitment of motor units, the size of the muscle involved, um, activating the muscle more, which is called twitch summation, and the TREP effect, and then getting muscles to optimal length. So first, um, we need to define what is actually activating the muscle. So all muscle fibers within a whole muscle are not active during every contraction. So if I'm just moving my arm with no load attached to it, there's only a few muscle cells that are active. If I'm moving something really heavy, I need to actually get more muscle cells active, and the body knows that. So it's not going to activate and use its full strength every time. It's going to save the strength of that. So there are several motor neurons dedicated to a single muscle or to a single group of muscle cells within a muscle. So all muscle cells within a whole muscle are not activate, activated by the same motor neuron. There's several motor neurons. Here there's pink, orange, red. So here is the pink motor neuron, which is attaching to all of the pink muscle fibers. Here's the orange motor neuron, which is attaching to all of the orange muscle fibers. Here's the red motor neuron, which is attaching to all the red muscle fibers. All of these muscle fibers are within a single muscle and there are several motor neurons attached to them. One motor neuron and all of the muscle fibers that it attaches to, so for example, the pink, is one motor unit. So here we have three motor units represented, the pink motor unit, the orange motor unit, and the red motor unit. The one motor neuron and all the fibers it innervates. If we want to increase the strength of a muscle then, we can just recruit more neurons, activate more motor neurons to activate more muscle cells. So if we activate more motor neurons, we will then activate all of the muscle cells it's attached to, and we call that motor unit recruitment. That will increase tension in the muscle as the load increases. We're going to play with this in a lab so you guys can think about how motor unit recruitment works. And you'll watch it in action as you apply more force to a particular muscle. There's also some baseline muscle tone which says that some muscle fibers are always active to maintain muscles even when no movement is taking place. And here this graph is showing that the more motor units you recruit or the more muscle fibers you activate, the stronger the contraction. And that makes sense if you think of this like a tug of war. So the more people that you have on the rope tugging, or the more muscle fibers you have pulling within the muscle, then the stronger the contraction is. There is also a difference in muscle size. This can be the number of muscle fibers per motor unit, or it can be the size of individual muscle fibers. So development determines the number of muscle cells and the, the general size of a particular muscle. So think of, say, the muscles in your leg compared to the muscles on your jaw. Big difference in size. That's developmental. We cannot affect the general number of muscle cells within a muscle, but we can um, actually make more protein inside a muscle cell. So the size of individual muscle fibers will be increased 
when fibers produce more myofilament. So with training and with exercise, fibers can make more actin and myosin in response to demands. And that then can cause hypertrophy or increase in muscle cell size. So bigger muscles have more motor fibers per motor neuron, that's sort of developmental. So here um, they give an example of a finger versus a leg muscle. And there's just a limit in a smaller muscle as to how much it can contract compared to a larger muscle. So if you recruit five or the maximum motor units in a finger muscle, versus five or the maximum motor units in a larger muscle, the larger muscle is always going to be stronger, even if they're both maximally activated. The next thing we can do is to change the amount of activation to a single muscle cell. So when you see these recordings now, we're looking within a muscle cell. So this is a single twitch of a single muscle cell, and here's an action potential stimulating that muscle cell. So there's your action potential with the latent period. There's your contraction phase. There's your relaxation phase. If you do this and you space apart the stimulation, you'll have a full contraction relaxation, delay, new stimulus, full contraction relaxation. So what's happening here is that calcium enters and then calcium is pumped back. Calcium enters, calcium is pumped back. So repeated stimulation is actually necessary to produce sustained and longer, longer duration contraction. So back to the sort of eye twitching I was talking about, right? Or if you've ever had a tiny twitch in your leg. That individual single twitch is not enough to actually produce anything significant with respect to movement. What we need is a long, sustained, and held contraction. And we do that by stimulating a muscle very close in time. When we stimulate a muscle very close in time, calcium builds up. And as calcium builds up and we don't give calcium time to go back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, we'll get summation or addition of activity, addition of contractions on top of each other. So this is what you would have if you space them apart, and then you'll get much more if you put them very close together. That's twitch summation. We can do this to the extreme where we deliver very, very, very close together stimulation to the point where there's actually absolutely no chance for the calcium to return back to the sarcoplasmic reticulum and you just dump a ton of calcium onto the sarcomere with no possibility of relaxation. When you do this with very high frequency stimulation, you will get a long, smooth, sustained contraction, which we call a tetanus or tetany. You want this in skeletal muscle if you're trying to hold an action and to get any sort of sustained force of contraction. It will hold then until the stimulation stops or until the muscle is fatigued. So we can do this by putting electrodes on muscles and stimulating them. The nervous system, however, is smart and knows how to do this already. So the nervous system knows the particular patterns of action potentials to send to a muscle to create tetanus. So comparing a single twitch, where you have calcium in, calcium out, long contraction, relaxation, calcium in, calcium out, contraction, relaxation, and then here's twitch summation. Calcium in, a little bit of calcium out, but not fully, and then calcium in again, and then calcium out. That's twitch summation. And then tons of calcium, 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 calcium. So much long sustained contraction with no possibility of relaxation. That's tetany. You can also get something called TREP. TREP is what we call the staircase effect. And this is increased contraction in response to multiple stimuli of the same strength. This is different than summation because relaxation occurs as there's increasing availability of calcium, but the calcium is able to get pumped back to the sarcoplasm. 
but this is sort of like priming a muscle. So this is one of the arguments for warming up. So you calcium in, calcium out. For some reason, the second time you do this, you'll get more calcium and down. So contractions increase because you will get sort of um, an enhancement of the elastic component of the muscle and as you increase heat or you warm up the muscle, the enzymes increase to make the contractions go more quickly. Excuse me, to make the contractions stronger. So calcium in, calcium out, but somehow with this repeated use of a muscle and increase in heat, um, increase in um, calcium from the SR and um, more optimal elastic component, then you will get this staircase effect with warming up. Finally, we need to talk about optimal length of a muscle. So this comes into play mainly if um, you're thinking about, say, a patient who has um, strained a muscle or torn a muscle. Um, generally development is set up such that muscles are already at their optimal length, um, but this is important to understand because it comes back to cross bridge formation. So the way that a muscle normally is set in the body is that it is at its optimal length. So there is where every myosin head is, there is an actin nearby for it to grab onto. So if the optimal amount of myosin and actin interaction at optimal length. If a muscle is stretched too far, then the myosin is too far from the actin, and even though the actin binding sites are available, the myosin can't reach them to grab on. So this will not provide much strength in muscle contraction. If they're too close, there's nowhere for the actin to go to create a change and to produce tension in the muscle. So the, the actin is already as close together as it can possibly get. The myosin can pull on it, but it's not going to make any difference in the tension. So optimal length of the muscle is important for maximizing cross bridge formation. So if we look at a muscle that is too short compared to a muscle that is optimal, compared to a muscle that is overstretched, this is what you see. A resting muscle normally in the body is at optimal muscle length. So your book has a diagram summarizing um, each of these um, uh, processes. And now we're going to talk a bit about metabolism. So the last bit is that muscles require ATP. So we saw ATP needed for the power stroke. We saw ATP needed for myosin unbinding from the actin. We also need ATP for active transport. The calcium getting pumped back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum and the sodium and potassium um, actively transported for the action potentials to occur. So ATP is the only energy source that can be used. So muscles have a few metabolic pathways for getting ATP um, in high quantities and very quickly. So muscles can do normal cellular respiration or aerobic, which is also called oxidative phosphorylation. But muscles can also have two alternate pathways. So muscles can do anaerobic respiration. Muscles also have creatine phosphate available. So first, creatine phosphate is the one we haven't heard about yet. So creatine phosphate is stored in muscle fibers. It's a rapid source of energy for about 10 to 15 seconds of contraction. The creatine phosphate transfers energy and a phosphate to ADP, forming ATP immediately. So it is basically holding on to an immediate source of phosphate bonds, which can provide that phosphate to ATP when needed. So it's a very quick, very fast source of energy. Muscles can also do anaerobic respiration in the form of glycolysis. So let's go back to um, our cellular respiration lecture where you have glucose going through 
the path of aerobic respiration. That first step of aerobic respiration is glycolysis, which does not require oxygen. Glucose will then get broken down into pyruvate. Pyruvate can then enter into aerobic respiration if oxygen is available. If oxygen is not available, then pyruvate will be um, broken down into lactic acid. So we get a couple of ATP from glycolysis alone, many more ATP from the full process of aerobic respiration. But if oxygen is not available, that couple of ATP can help a muscle cell function. Muscle cells also store a lot of glycogen. Glycogen is glucose bound together into a polysaccharide. So this is an easy source of glucose for the muscle immediately available without relying on glucose from the bloodstream. So oxidative phosphorylation is the aerobic respiration that occurs in the mitochondria. It's the main normal source when oxygen is plentiful and it is fueled first by the glycogen stores in the muscle. So glycogen is stored um, in high quantities in muscle cells. Muscles can also use <coughs> excuse me, glucose and fatty acids delivered by the blood. This can provide hours of muscle contraction for prolonged moderate activity, but it is slower because it requires delivery of oxygen and glucose. Glycolysis then will be um, the primary source in the absence or in the depleted oxygen state. Pyruvic acid will then be converted to lactic acid and acid can build up. This will produce a small amount of ATP but it can occur very quickly. This can provide about 30 to 60 seconds of very high level intense activity. So if we look at Overall, the pathways that can be used, there is glycogen stored in the muscle and glucose that can come from other sources to go into glycolysis. The glucose will then be broken down into pyruvate. If oxygen is available, then the normal oxidative phosphorylation will occur. If oxygen is depleted, then pyruvate will be broken down to lactate and then into lactic acid. There's also um, ATP that is then, uh, so this provides um, ATP for the contraction and ATP for the various pumps that are required. There's also then creatine phosphate, which is immediately available and stored when ATP and phosphate bonds are plentiful. And it can be used as a quick source of phosphate bonds to provide ATP. Fatigue then will happen um, if muscles are depleted of ATP. Anaerobic respiration will be less efficient as lactic acid accumulates and the pH drops. So as remember that as acid goes up, pH goes down. And muscle fibers will lose potassium as the sodium potassium pump is unable to restore the ion balance. So the sodium potassium pump requires ATP and if ATP becomes depleted, then it's not going to be working as efficiently. So fatigue then, or neuromuscular fatigue, is caused by um, a shortage of neurotransmitters at the neuromuscular junction. So there's physiological fatigue, which is lack of ATP, and then there's psychological fatigue, which is lack of neurotransmitter or lack of activation. So the central nervous system has to activate the neuromuscular junction. That causes excitation contraction coupling, which releases calcium. Calcium is then the contraction relaxation signaling. And we can have various forms of fatigue based on central or peripheral depletion of either the stimulus, which is the neurotransmitter release, or the calcium and ATP. Oxygen debt um, is then uh, difficult on muscles um, and it is the amount of extra oxygen that the body must take in to restore muscle chemistry back to a resting state.
So the liver has to convert lactic acid back to pyruvic acid when oxygen becomes available again. The glycogen stores have to be replenished. The creatine has to be rephosphorylated, and then the oxygen will have to return and rebind to the oxygen binding myoglobin protein in the muscle. For this, we can also look at different muscle fiber types, and this can get super interesting. There's a lot of very interesting um, genetic and kinesiology studies on um, athletes um, of varying abilities and the muscle fiber types that they can actually vary in genetically. So muscle fibers can differ in their methods of metabolism based on either the pathways they use to produce ATP, being some muscle fibers are more oxidative, some muscle fibers are more glycolytic. They can also um, differ in how quickly their ATPase enzymes work. So some muscles have fast ATPases, some muscles have slow ATPase enzymes. And this can affect the speed of contraction. So generally we talk about three types of muscle, slow, which will have slow ATPases, and oxidative, those are type 1. Fast, which will have fast ATPases, and oxidative, those are type 2A. And then fast, fast ATPases, and glycolytic, which are type 2X. So slow oxidative muscle fibers are very slow to contraction, but most resistant to fatigue. So these are very good for endurance and continuous contraction. They are very well equipped for oxidative phosphorylation. What do you need for a lot of cellular respiration? Well, you need a lot of mitochondria and you need a lot of oxygen. So we can get a lot of oxygen by having a lot of myoglobin protein to store the oxygen and also a rich supply of capillaries. The fast oxidative are fast to contraction, but resistant to fatigue. So these are also very well equipped for oxidative phosphorylation, and they have fast ATPase activity. So they're sort of like intermediate fibers. Then fast glycolytic fibers are fast to contract, but they fatigue very quickly. So these are our power and speed athletes, right? So they have high glycogen reserves, and they um, rely mainly on glycolysis, so they don't need oxygen, they're gonna work very quickly, but they can then fatigue quickly because of the lactic acid buildup. They will be large fibers that can generate more force, but they will have poor nutrient diffusion. They will also look lighter in color because they have less myoglobin storing oxygen, so they're doing mostly anaerobic respiration. They will also have fewer capillaries and fewer mitochondria. So your book has another summary diagram of the differences between these fibers. Lastly, I want to talk about the effects of exercise on muscle fibers. We talked about it briefly already, but let's um, formalize it here. So aerobic exercises result in more efficient muscle metabolism and resistant to fatigue. It also increases capillaries, mitochondria, and myoglobin. In addition to that, it will increase the efficiency of the heart, lungs, general body metabolism, and muscular coordination that can aid muscle function. Resistance exercising, weightlifting, and isometric type contractions, lifting very heavy loads, um, can produce more myofilaments and myofibrils, causing hypertrophy. This can also increase glycogen stores and increase muscle size and strength. But remember, you can't get more muscle cells. That's development. You can only get bigger muscle cells by packing them full of actin and myosin protein. Okay. So I hope this was interesting for you guys. I find muscle mechanics and uh, muscle physiology to be very interesting. Um, let me know if you have any questions, and this will conclude everything that you need to study for Unit 2. So good luck on your next exam.